So, first of all, what is GATS? It is a WTO trade agreement. It's one of 18 in the family of WTO agreements. Um, it includes trade rules, which are designed to limit government authority. That's the whole reason that they're there. So it's not like a conspiracy theory that GATS rules are designed to constrain governing authority. And when you're talking about services, it's not only the majority of the U.S. economy, it's the kind of act economic activity that states traditionally regulate and local governments traditionally provide. So the GATS is the most local of all the global agreements in terms of its effect on government. Uh, the WTO is also a dispute settlement process, as the Antigua case illustrates, and it's a forum for future negotiations. The GATS has a built-in agenda of never-ending negotiations of several kinds, and I'll list those in just a minute. So Congress need not legislate in the future to propel GATS negotiations. They're wired into the agreement. I've given you a picture of the WTO structure, and I circled for you the, the part of the WTO that really is the home of these negotiations. It's called the Council for Trade and Services. It's a major institution within the WTO. And um, it reports to a committee on trade negotiations that then reports to the Ministerial con Council, which is where the final decisions on WTO rules are made. So that gives you a sense of the organizational connection. And stay still. The coverage of the GATS is literally from A to Z in terms of the spectrum of services. A service, of course, is defined in the Oxford English Dictionary as something you can't drop on your foot. And so imagine all the things that people do in states regulate going from alcoholic beverages to building permits through financial services to zoning. All these are types of measures that affect trade and service. The measure doesn't have, the state measure doesn't have to directly regulate a service as long as it has an effect on the, the service. excitement is relevance to explain to people that local laws are indeed covered by these trade commitments. And then the question becomes, well, what's the impact of that? What is exactly the legal nature of the conflict and if that exists, does that mean some other country is really going to use their clout under the WTO to pressure the United States? Or alternatively, can the big companies use this framework that's been created for nations to negotiate with each other to lobby, to pressure from within the system, or to even persuade parts of the federal government of the United States to use their, their treaty obligations, mm -hmm. if you will, under trade agreements to pressure states, either political pressure or threat of uh, enforcement through a federal lawsuit to preempt state law or the old-fashioned method of withholding money if the states don't come into compliance. That's, this, that's the approach that's used on everything from the driving age to, uh, uh, to nuclear physics. So there are two kinds of trade rules in the GATS. If I may, I'll call them specific commitments and more general ones. And by specific, what I mean is they apply to individual economic sectors. The GATS is a list of 120-something, as I recall, boxes, if you will, individual economic sectors, like financial services is a box, but there's subsectors with respect to banking and insurance and, and credit cards. I want you to imagine a Venn diagram, if you will. Imagine a fried egg that hasn't been broken yet. Um, the middle part of the egg, the smaller part, is a set of specific commitments. And I, it's, the, it's not the whole egg because it's... It's a bunch of selected subsets. <laughs> we're talking about trade rules that apply to those specific commitments where the United States has said, yes, we're going to follow these rules. Not all services, just these specific commitments. And let me give you a couple examples. Um, one is called national treatment. And uh, that basically is jargon for thou shalt not discriminate against foreign service suppliers. So that's pretty easy to grasp. The other is called market access. And, this, and the rule on, on market access says, basically translated, Thou shalt not set quantitative limits on service suppliers. What's a quantitative limit? A quota, a monopoly, obviously, a limits on the number of employees. So in the gambling case, Antigua successfully argued that the ban on internet gambling was a de facto quota of zero. And they won that argument. If you apply the same argument to regulation of tribal monopolies, which is a quota of one in a certain geographic area or region, um, what's the argument that there's a public moral concern about gambling? You license it, you regulate it, you tax it. You're just saying that only a certain group of people get the benefit of that enterprise. And they happen to be domestic. By definition, domestic governmental organizations not open to the market. <clears throat> and you can, I think you can see that you know the kind of state laws that set quantitative limits on gambling, limits on the number of casinos, the number of slots, tribal monopolies. Um, I won't go on with that list. Let me shift over to the general obligations. Okay. These are, it's a different um, 
set of trade rules that apply much more broadly. Uh, if, you, if you bring the egg back into your mind, um, this is the white part of the egg. It's the large part. It's the, it's the scope of all services. It's, it's any measure that might affect trade in a service with the exception of probably free government services. Free government services like offering a free library or a free park or a free school would not be covered because it's not commercial. But if you charge anything, a user fee, for example, a utility bill, uh, or a fee to use certain library services, then it's commercial in nature according to, to the WTO Secretariat, and there's a strong likelihood that it's both covered and the measure might be in conflict with the trade rule. The kind of trade rules that come under here, I will just give you a very quick uh, sense of um, Domestic regulation has two really important rules. One is that domestic measures must be objective and transparent. The other is that they must be no more burdensome than necessary to ensure the quality of the service. In the legislature, you find yourself being pressured by multiple sides on any given issue. So let's imagine a, a measure to regulate business. So one side says most, the other side says least. And what most legislatures do is look for compromise that actually might work. That's the nature of the democratic legislative process. This trade rule says, it must be least burdensome, that the middle of the spectrum is inconsistent with trade rules. Let me mention one or two just to give you a sense of what's on the table. Library services, uh, higher education is being offered as a sector commitment by the United States. And some new energy commitments are important because they are literally volatile. Uh, that is to say that they relate to bulk storage facilities and pipeline transportation of fuels, which clearly, I think, apply to of federal or state decision making with respect to liquid natural gas terminals. Yeah. And that's the big question. Where is the United States on this set of proposals? Has the United States already essentially accepted this as a compromise such that if these terms become the core of a new set of domestic uh, rules on domestic regulation, the United States will stand back and let it go through? There's been no public discussion, no public announcement, no public anything from the United States trade negotiators, and no issue could be more important. This is the most important, broad-reaching issue for state and local governments. Could you know 